it's now 2017, and I'm sure that you, <laughs> I'm sure that this video that we're about to see uh, will get you up to speed if you don't already know about him, which I find would be uh, almost impossible. Are we doing the video first? Okay. Hello from sunny Arizona. My name is Carla Berg. I'm a longtime journalist, a former SPM board member, and have also been a self-help advisor thousands of times to patients online since the early days of the internet. In fact, doing that work was the first chance that I had to team with ePatient Dave, who I'm pleased to say still remains a close long distance friend almost 30 years later. I'm here today to share two different stories related to SPM. The first about the group as an organization and the second about some teamwork that got a lot of good work done. Four years ago this week, I was sitting in the same hotel during the same healthcare conference, but for a different kind of SPM gathering, our first ever face-to-face -face board retreat. Even then, four years back and four years in, it was clear we had bonded around us broadly helped vision that was inspired by our founder, the late Dr. Tom Ferguson. All of us present imagined a future in which patients would routinely partner with clinicians solving problems as peers, each with their own expertise. Strands of that more collaborative culture can now be seen coast to coast today, but that future is not yet distributed evenly. This makes it especially important to applaud successful teamwork with patients when we see it. And that brings me to the second story. Fifteen months ago, one member of SBM made an enormous difference in the life of the other by sharing pivotal insights at a time with a very grateful result. If I was not stuck at home nursing a couple of broken bones, I would be there in person to applaud the specialist who I think of as Dr. Mensch for having the heart to lend me his ear a number of times last year. Had we not connected just when we did via Marilyn Mann, another SBM friend, I would have accepted a date for open heart surgery that, as it turned out, I did not need in response to a supposed heart attack that, as it turned out, I did not have. But instead of checking in for that massive surgery and its protracted recovery, the cheerful con specialist encouraged me to take my time to solicit a range of opinion before scheduling anything. Then the kindly man stayed available as the new evidence rolled in. None of those new opinions suggested surgery for me, and a later test confirmed that I had not even had a heart attack. For the details of how that was possible, look for my byline on the SPM blog next month. As you may already be guessing, my excellent mentor now friend is also one of your speakers today, a widely respected cardiologist from Yale, Harlan Krumholtz. Once I knew he would be here today, I knew I needed to be present in some way too expressing double gratitude, both for his being present for SPM and for his being present for me. From the bottom of my heart, Harlan Krumholtz, let me say simply thank you for having the heart to help mine. Well, talk about a nice testimonial for the work that you do. Thank you. So you're here to speak now about nothing about me without me. Changing the assumptions of medicine, which we now is, I guess, an uh, old Polish saying, nothing without me, uh, nothing about me without me, as Dr. Uh, Del Banco said this morning. So come on up and take it away. Thank you. Well, that was the most amazing introduction I've ever had. And, and it's thank you for your introduction. Carla, I think you're listening. Thank you. That was... Uh, that was just remarkable and so appreciated. Um, so, uh, you know, in the course of my own journey, I've run into so many amazing people. And I, when I was asked to give this talk, I, I immediately said yes. I mean, as soon as I could figure it out on my calendar that I could make my way here, it, it was never a question of wanting to be. It was only whether I could because, uh, I don't know, there's like a bunch of fellow travelers here, people who share common, common ideas and hopes and aspirations and an impetus for change that will leave us better off than where we are today. And so I was touched to be asked. I'm honored to be here. And let me just get started. So do I know what I'm doing? OK. Hmm. 
Hmm. I can just talk, but <laughs> go, go ahead. <laughs> Well, um, the first slide, which I'll breeze through, is my disclosures. <laughs> in, my, in my first disclosure is that I am tremendously committed to making medicine better than what it is. So everything I'm going to say is going to be in some way through that prism of saying where we are is it, we need to change. The second was that I wanted to just talk about this nothing about me with, without me. So, you know, it's almost become a, a little trite to say this, this phrase, and I know... I have a picture of Tom in the article that they published in the Land of People Power, as I understood the derivation of that. And I know Tom Del Banco talked about that a little bit today. But I still, when I was asked to give this talk, couldn't think of anything better than to name it than that, because I still think it's the, see, I'm deeply committed to shifting the balance of power in medicine so people can be empowered, engaged, equipped, and enabled, what this group's all about and to achieve the health outcomes they seek. And I do have a variety of relationships. I think we'll hand this out or post it so people can see. We don't have to show. Oh, yeah, I wanted to say this. So one of the things is, in the course of this, I will be critical of my tribe, the group of people who are health professionals. But I want to say that I'm, I have deep respect for every healthcare professional. I do think they're heroes. I think the people are out there trying to do their best. They go into the profession in order to do their best. So in the course of our criticism, I think I understand it as criticizing a system that has put people in a position where it's very hard to do the work that they would like to be able to do. All things being equal, I don't know many healthcare professionals who don't want to empower and engage their patients, take the time to help them make the decisions that are best for them. So I, I just want to be clear that there's, when we're talking about positive change and the way that things are and the way that things should be, I don't think it's about bad people. I think it's about a system that became oriented in a way that, that served the people who were there to serve. And in some ways, we're keeping the, the trains going without thinking about what it was like to see through the eyes of the people that were there to help. And so I, I just want to call that out. But as I was saying, this nothing about me without me is the key fundamental point, which is are we moving so fast that we leave the people behind? Are we so intent on checking the task list in front of us that we miss the opportunity to say, wait a minute, who is this really about? And so as Tom talked about, I wanted to at least give uh, respect to the way in which this emerged, even as its roots are much older, but it was really Tom and his group, and I, I first heard from Don Berwick, this notion of saying that we wouldn't move so fast that we would leave people behind, that nothing should occur about people without their involvement. Um, so I want to talk about these assumptions, and, and, and in some ways this is a, an admission of w what I was taught, what I learned through the process of the socialization that took me from a, a bright-eyed college graduate through the course of medical training and, and in preparation to take responsibility to help people in their uh, battles with illness and with their aspirations to achieve health. You know, we, the, the basic assumptions were that people expect to be told what to do. That's your job. That's why you're trained to be a doctor. That's why you go to school all those years. So people could turn to you and say, what should I do? And that you could take that knowledge that you had and your understanding of the world and the value system that you brought to bear into the situation, and that you, by God, would tell them what was best for them. And that, that was a, whether that was a hidden curriculum or... Well, wherever that came from, I think it was loud and clear, a fundamental assumption. And when you talk about the challenge of making change in medicine, you have to understand that the vast majority of, of healthcare professionals, and particularly physicians, were trained this way. So no matter what we say in this room, they still can't wrap their heads around the idea that people aren't just expecting it. And by the way, we train our patients so much this way, that to expect this. So the fact that, that people are often looking to them will tell me what to do, they don't recognize that that's because all our body language, the way in which we talk, the inflection of our voice, it's all coaching people to basically look to us for the answer and to not feel confident that they can participate in that. So this is a very, very strong assumption. Another assumption is that people expect it to be shielded from information. I, I'm talking about what our assumptions were. I'm not talking about what yours are or what people's are. I'm saying what the assumptions are from what we were taught. Be careful. 
If you include people in the decision, then imagine if something goes wrong, the regret they'll feel. The regret they'll feel because they made a choice that turned out bad. So you've got to protect them from that kind of information. Because if something goes bad, then maybe they can, they can blame you, but they won't have to have had the burden of having to feel that they made that decision. And I was just reading this week, there's this uh, uh, blog, uh, you may see, Brain Pickings, uh, uh, Marie Popova writes it, you know, and she was writing this weekend about Richard Feynman and his wife. His wife had gotten ill, and, and the whole story was around how when she got ill, they didn't want to tell her she was dying. And, but there are many stories like that in medicine where there were dire illnesses, uh, big decisions, and families and doctors and everyone said, we need to protect people from information. They can't handle knowing the truth. And so this assumption is, again, implicit hidden curriculum. It's spread widely, and it, it shades the way that many people in the healthcare profession think. Again, well-intended, but the notion is, uh, if you took it to its extreme, that our patients are children, and we have to look out for them because they aren't fully-fledged adults who are able to process information and make active choices about life-threatening issues. They, they're too weak in that moment. And so we have to protect them from that information. And I, I think the third assumption is that people expect to defer to authority. You're a shaman. You're there to, 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 to come in to great fanfare. And the more important you are, the, you know, the higher you are on the pecking order, the bigger you are in the hierarchy, the more that people, the, the, the water will part. You know, the, the, the young trainees will move aside so the senior physician can walk into the room and everyone can, can just listen and defer to what the, the top-down says. And so th these are very strong assumptions. And I, I argue that if we're really going to make progress, it starts with understanding these issues and the degree to which they are embedded in the psyche of the medical establishment. So it's going to begin with education and the medical schools and how that's broken down. It begins with understanding the role of teams and collaboration it begins with recognizing the contributions that people can make at every different level. And it begins by saying that we're all in this together in partnership to try to achieve goals, not as a singular person on high coming down and conferring wisdom that everyone else is going to follow. The notion of the person in the center rather than the doctor in the center is, is a new vision of the way in which healthcare can proceed. And it's not one that has necessarily gained traction yet, despite the fact that when we're talking among ourselves, we take it as second nature that this is the way things should be. But it, it's not one that necessarily within the halls of medicine, and when people are transacting quickly, that is one that is, is widely embraced. And I'll just say that what needs to change is in order to attack this, in order to understand it, in order for us to get to a different way that things are done, I think it starts, I put it at the top, with culture. We, we have to take a, a hard look at the culture of our medical world. I mean, the degree to which is there the opportunity for people to question? Is there the mutual respect for everyone, both not just patient healthcare professionals, but among healthcare professional teams? So there's not a natural way where someone walks in and their word is just the word, but that there's an ability for that. And then the structure. There's no way you're going to institute this if it's a one-size-fits-all, seven-minute visit for everyone who comes in. And in part, that's going to be, it's not going to be that you, the only visits are going to be with doctors. We have to see how the team does. And I will even go further to say, we have to start to be disruptive in our thinking about, well, what's the use of an office visit anyway? I mean, who's the office visit really benefiting if you've got to spend your day going? What's the waiting room for? What's up with that? Why is there a waiting room? And why is it set like that in terms of the, the relationship? I was down at Dell Medical School. They built a clinic. They had a design guy, the guy from Adeo, who was there uh, doing their health care, has come to Dell. They don't have a waiting room. They're saying, why should we have a waiting room in this clinical building? I thought, great respect to them for thinking like that. But the notion, again, you're coming to me. I'm the one sitting in a room. As much time as it takes you, you'll finally get to see me. Or one size fits all. When one person really needs 45 minutes, another person probably doesn't need to see a doctor. 
And by the way, on health education, who is best positioned to do health education? How much training did I get in health education? How much is my time? How much is other people's time? How much time is there? How does it get spread? Are people doing what they're best positioned to do? And then the incentives in the system have to change. Again, the business of medicine has to be paid attention. If Iora is doing a great job because they have inspiring leaders, what we need is what routinely occurs everywhere. We need leaders to show the way, but we need incentives and structures to make it so this is not exceptional, but this is routine. I always say the top 1% of places in the country can't take care of 100% of the people. We need routine excellence. We need to spread and scale the way that things should be. We don't need to just be celebrating the unusual exceptional. We need to figure out, we need to applaud it and then spread it and make it just boring routine. That's just the way things happen. And the question is, how are we going to accomplish that? So I'm going to go through a series of things where I'm saying I think there needs to be a new set of assumptions that are replacing those old assumptions. And I think it starts with, and many of you know this about me, I think it starts with your data. I think it starts with your rights to your data, the transparency, the ability for you to move, not being trapped within the group that you're in, your ability to get second opinions, your ability to, to leverage it in ways that are beneficial. If you cannot see your data, then by nature you are, you are at a disadvantage with anything that you want to do within healthcare. So access to your data is just the start. This isn't the whole thing at all. But the question is, can you get access to your data? And why? And I just say, because like, it's yours, it's yours, it's yours, it's yours, it's yours, it's yours, it's yours. It's about you, it's about you, it's about you, it's about you, it's about you. And stakes are high, stakes are high, stakes are high. Like, I don't even know why I've got to say why, but I can say, you know, because I believe transparency is one of the strongest methods of improving quality. If, if people know that others are going to see their work, I guarantee you it will automatically elevate the quality of work that they do. If you know that many people have the possibility of reading what you've written, seeing how you think, how is the work organized? By the way, is it just a mess? It's just that. Is it a mess or is it organized? That's going to tell you something about the quality of the care that's being provided. That trend, I, I'm, a, I'm, in, I'm a quality, uh, I, I create quality measures. I mean, we work with the government. We do a whole range of things. I can tell you in the end of the day, you cannot measure enough to get all the nooks and crannies of things that are important in medicine by measurement. But transparency, so people can actually see what's going on behind the curtain, that is an impetus to make sure that people are doing it right. By the way, have I got your allergies right? Did I get what you said correctly? Am I, have I even said you're the right person? I mean, my wife said that, you know, ECG showed up in her chart that they she didn't have an ECG. You know, where did that even come from? So, you know, that kind of transparency will change things. Accountability, the accuracy, the usability, but just the power of being able to have your data with you and being able to take it wherever you want fundamentally shifts the balance of power within, within healthcare. But, you know, I, I just go back to, you know, one of my heroes, Hugo Campos, who any many of you know and uh, everyone adores. So, I mean, Hugo really turned me on to this in the beginning because he, he was in this fight to get his data. He's still working <laughs> tirelessly to try to do this. But, you know, when, when I asked him why he was so interested, I mean, he just said, it's my data. Like, it, there's something about it that made him hold to say, why aren't I able to get my, why am I not able to get my own data? And uh, I, he's right. And I just want to say for this group, this group is a very savvy group, but I just want to say, if you go on the ONC website, it says the HIPAA Act of 1996 provides you with health information privacy rights. These rights are important. Your health information rights to right to access your health information, right to an accounting of disclosures of your health information, right to correct or amend your health information, right to access your health information. We all know that that's just not true now. It's a federal right that's violated every day. Right to an accounting disclosures. Every healthcare institution has business associate agreements where people are sucking data 
out of the healthcare institutions, de-identifying it and selling it, without your knowledge, you have a right to know where your data went. I don't know a single institution that can give you that accounting. That's your federal right. I, I don't know anyone who can give you that. You should be able to go to any healthcare institution, any covered entity that has your data, and say, by the way, who did you give my records to? And they should be able to give you a list. They're federally mandated to be able to give you a list, and they can't do it. And you should be able to amend your record. One of the things that came up when we started doing open notes, which are congratulations to Yale near the health system. We have fully embraced it. But I will tell you in the beginning, the first thing that was brought up when we got resistance about doing it was, what are we going to do when everyone sees all the errors? How are we going to manage that? <laughs> There's something backwards where you don't see that as a good thing to be able to fix the record. It was like, how are we possibly going to handle that? And then people started getting up to you know, the, the, the unusual circumstances where, well, we just said this person was obese, and now they're going to fight about us whether they're obese or not. You, you know, it, it's, it's the small stuff that people think about. And, in, and the opportunities, instead of saying, if we've got a lot of errors, we've got to fix them, wasn't immediately on their, their radar screen. But uh, again, push through. We have it. It's embraced. It's, it's now part of the culture. But, but I'm telling you what the things are. So I just want to go through this. The patient rights, this is from ONC documents. Accessing and obtaining copies of one health information for one's own purpose is a right, not a privilege, which is fundamental to your ability to participate in our healthcare system. If this group can't make this happen, what group can make this happen? It, it, we don't have to get a law passed, it's passed. We don't have to get the right, we got the right. What's missing is the enforcement and implementation of this right, which again, I don't consider to be uh, sufficient to make change, but I consider it necessary to make change. If you don't have this, I don't think that we can move forward on the other's part. This right extends to a broad array of information. Lab results, images, prescriptions, notes, as well as to data holders, doctors, hospitals, health plans, and providers. Liz, this is like you have a right to your stuff. And wherever it sits in every covered entity, they all have an obligation to do it, whether it's Aetna or United or whether it's Yale, or whether it's a doctor's office, or whether it's CVS, or Walgreens, or Walmart, who's ever the covered entity, they are obligated if you call in order to do the plus. What's more, and the reason that your thing about the pricing so bothered me today was, per page charges do not apply when the individual is requesting a copy of information maintained electronically. I'm not writing this. I'm copying it from the ONC document. So. Next year, we need the head of ONC to be sitting at this meeting, and we need to say, when does this start? You're sending out stuff. No, but I mean, they're sending out government documents that is saying stuff that's just not happening. So I don't know how much they should label it fiction. I mean, what, is it in the nonfiction side or is it in the fiction side? I mean, really, is it fantasy literature? What is it exactly? You can't continue, and believe me, everyone in ONC, they want this to happen. So these are really good professionals who care about this stuff. So I am not in any way saying they don't, but that they don't have the political capital to push it forward. And there's, you know what political capital is more important than any political capital? People. I know there's lots of lobbyists and things, but you know what matters most are people. So how do you start helping them because all they're doing is reflecting what the law says, but we know none of this is true. And if you go, even to my own institution, people will send you to the basement where they easily know how to deal with the request at 39 cents a page, up to 400 bucks for your record. You say, I want my digital stuff and can't charge me per page. They don't know what you're talking about. And they can't really charge more than $6.50 for the processing of that stuff. I want to go back to this because I just think it's so important too. Lab results, but look, images. It's images, too. It means, like, it's not just the report, but you say, I want to go for a second opinion because I just got an important diagnosis. How hard is that? You're sick. You're dealing with a lot of emotional issues. You're, try you're overwhelmed with what you've got to do. And the last thing you want to do is have to fight with your healthcare institution to be able to get something which you have a federal right to, to be able to move it to get second opinion. I mean, we as a group have got to figure out what are the things we definitely want to solve. And like, again, I'm telling you, this is not going to change medicine, but it's the start of saying no, because I believe it's going to start competition too. Because if I can easily go across the street, if I can easily go across town, now people have got to say, like, we could lose those patients. Right now they know they've got you. It's too much hassle. And if you're sick, 
You do not have the energy to fight through this. And, and for those who do get second opinions, God bless you because it's hard. It's really hard. And like that's going to change things. So, you know, I love a, one of my heroes, the patient Dave, you know, they, I, I love the work he did for the Open Notes, love the Seinfeld episode, it was really great. They loved the, I couldn't, I couldn't find the one with the, with the nine faces on it, but this was the blog that you did. But the, the uh, what happened, by the way, with that whole episode? Did they ever get you your stuff? No, he, he stopped responding. Stop. So, That's the, this is the Streisand effect, which is it's easier to stop an argument than respond because the, the response becomes the story. So here's one of the nation's leading patient advocates, articulate, well-known, visible, at one of the leading healthcare institutions in the country, which arguably has one of the most advanced and sophisticated approaches to health information technology, and they're paying attention to everything except, by the way, he would like to get his records, and he would like to get them according to the way the federal rights say that he should get them, and still to today he hasn't gotten what he wants out of it. It doesn't make any sense, and it's something which needs to be fixed. New assumption, people have a right to their data. Like, this has to be cultural, structural, incentivized. There need to be consequences if you're not doing it. It needs to be fixed. And I think somehow this group, we need to figure out how do we gain accountability for this. Not because, again, we think it's enough, but we think it's necessary. So the question is, how can, can we... I'm up for anything, but... I, I think the question is, how can we let the institutions know we're serious? Because what they, what they will say to me when I bring this up is, people don't really want their records. We, we don't see anyone asking for it. We don't really think people want it. When someone like, like Dave asks for it, they kind of say, well, he's just a crackpot, you know. <laughs> he, they, will, they will marginalize the people who ask for it. So I think the first step is to say, no, we're really serious. We believe this is important. And to see whether we can do it collaboratively. But I think the, the question of, of how far you're willing to go to say that this is a right that's not being respected, I think has to be done. The second I want to talk about is options. I don't mean options for that. I'm leaving that assumption and strategy. There's another second piece to this that I think is really critical and important for, for people. It's like that people have the knowledge and the permission to be able to make choices that the doctor in front of them might not be recommending. Now, they might not choose for themselves. That, that people know that there are legitimate options that people might choose uh, given the situation that they're facing. And I say shared decision making. What exactly is shared about it? I, I know you guys have talked about it, you had a panel about it, but I don't get what the shared part is, really. And I think we ought to change the name. You know, it's like, uh, it's my decision. It's like my body, I'm facing a situation. I, I, we're not both going to live with what happens as a result of this decision. <laughs> and so, like, I think I want to be coached, I want to be guided, I want to be informed, I want to be helped. But, like, what part do you own of this, you know, legitimately? Like, where, where, what's your claim to this decision? It really isn't shared. I mean, I think the shared part was, it was my decision from my assumption. I'm the doc. It's my decision. I'm going to tell you what to do. So, okay, I'll go halfway. We'll share it. You know, it's like, <laughs> fine, that's not as threatening as saying it's your decision. But it's your decision. So... We, that doesn't mean we abandon you, doesn't mean we leave you alone, doesn't mean we say, damn it, go ahead and make your own damn decision. It means we're with you. We're your companion, we're your guide, we're your coach, we're your source of information, we're as much as we can a source of strength. But, but, but let's be honest, we need to help you make the choice that's right for you. And that's different feel than the notion of shared that, hey, let's make this together. I don't know, because if you don't make what, if we're not both happy there's a problem here. That's the implication to me in the shared part. If, if, I, if we're not, we, it's got to be shared so we're both happy with what's been chosen, as opposed to, no, you need to be happy. I need to make sure what you decided was right for you. I can go faster. <laughs> um, how much time do I have? Five minutes, okay, I'll go really fast. So, you see this thing, I think people could understand this as being the patient and the doctor. I don't. I see it as two doctors. You know that doctors don't always see things the same way? No. But this is like, do people have the permission to say, here's what I'm recommending, but you know, if you came in to see somebody else, they might recommend something different. 
Do I have permission to choose? That patients need to be given permission to see the options and make choices. Do they have the knowledge they need? We did a study where we found that most people undergoing uh, getting stents, this time it was angioplasty, thought that their lives were going to be extended, that they were going to prevent heart attacks. That's just not true when people are get, undergoing it for stable disease. They had a, very much a misperception about it. I did an article and I said, what should we be telling people? And I'm glad to share this, but I, I still don't think we're doing it. Have we told people that medical therapy is a legitimate option for almost everyone for whom interventions are being recommended? What are the potential benefits, the risks? Also, what's the experience of your healthcare team? What's the pitch to whether you should be having it there or not? People have a right to decide and to the relevant information. And then finally, what else? That's the assumption. That's the key assumption. The last assumption is about information. What else needs to change? We talk a lot about information asymmetry. When relevant information is known to some but not to all parties involved. We talk about that in, in, in the physician-patient uh, relationship. The docs know things, patients don't. That, you know what the real truth is? There's most of the stuff God knows and nobody else knows because we haven't learned it yet. There's so much uncertainty in medicine, we're not honest about that degree of uncertainty, and we're not working together as a collective in order to generate the knowledge that we need. It's what's missing that's the problem. Given your unique circumstances, how do we under inform you about what your risks and benefits are and what, what's available to you? I say the scientific enterprise can't keep pace with the information needs of people and patients. And, and I think that we have the power to generate this data together, knowledge generated in everyday practice. This is where we need to go. Each person's better off for the contributions that they're making to the people that follow them. I'm better off because of the people ahead of me. People behind me are better off because I'm sharing the information about my experience. It's like when we're driving a car. I know there's no traffic here because the people that were a mile ahead of me, their data has helped me. My data is going to help the people behind me. We need to create a culture, an ethos, a structure within medicine that we're saying no one's experience gets sequestered. It's all collectively understood, organized, and systematically learned from. So the next person's always better off than the last person. And we do it with permission. It's in front of us. It's by our participation. It's not because someone behind our back is taking advantage of us. And I think people, this is a new assumption, people have a right to actively participate in research. And research can be faster, better, and cheaper because of it. And people are given are integrated into the governance. They're respected and honored. They're told what the results are. They're part of a community. They're true partners in the knowledge generation enterprise. We've totally flipped this and say, you can't have it without it. And I say, if you look for this, all these things together, this is Sarah Gari, you know, is a person who lives with Parkinson's, an activated patient. Another inspiration to me, but she's part of this. We're not waiting. The, the real impetus for change comes from people who, for whom time moves differently. If you're progressively debilitating illness, time moves differently than if you're the doctor walking in the room. You are in a rush. You need for information to be generated. You need for the systems to change. You need to be supported in ways. And I would say to all of you who are pushing the edges of this uh, movement, the most important thing is you're not alone. You're not unreasonable. And you're not too annoying, bothersome, or irritating. You're, you're doing very important work that's critical, that's sometimes uncomfortable, but, but needs to be done. You're bringing much needed change. And I think it's going to be through the collective action. So this comes back to the society. By, as individuals, it's hard to move. Collectively, we need to figure out, and, and it has to go far beyond this room. It has to be millions of people who feel empowered and connected and benefited by being part of a community that's contributing to making a future better than it was in the past. I think part of this is access to data, control over decisions, participation in research. These are three planks. We're going to make sure people have access to data. We're going to ensure that people have, it's their decisions, and that the culture is going to shift to recognize that, and we're going to create the avenues for people to participate in research like has never happened before because we're going to increase the speed and bandwidth and scope of the knowledge so it can inform the future choices. The culture, structure, and incentives. And I say to make progress, every doc on my side needs to see through the eyes of patients, feel through the hearts of patients, and make it better for the next person who follows by our support of the people who are trying to bring about change. And ultimately, we will achieve this, nothing about me without me. Thank you.
it's uh, such a shame that you have no passion for what you do. <laughs> um, thank you so much. I think that was great. And I don't know if no, we have any time. Maybe Shannon should uh, come up. Okay. Do, can we, do, do anybody, uh, we have a time for a couple of questions, I guess. So I'm going to let you go, I'll, and then we'll. I'll, I'll be quick because it's a statement. You have to be on the microphone because it's being recorded. Uh, one right next to the camera. It's plugged into audio. <laughs> Somebody taught me to think independently. The, um, <laughs> yeah, that was my mom. Uh, seriously, the, uh, I, I want it to be clear, that blog post that you put up that I th said there was responding to my CIO, the, the issue there was not just me recording, my, requesting my information. My hospital CIO, Beth Israel Deaconess, had blogged that of two million patients at Beth Israel Deaconess, not a single one had ever tried to download their complete record. I, w I thought, where the hell is that button? And I went there, uh, and there is no button to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it? What's going on here? There's a smoke screen. So I asked tech support, and they gave me a vague answer, and I asked, but what about? And they gave me another one. And on the third try, and that's the screen capture that Hartland showed, on the, on the third try, they finally said, we do not offer a button to do that. All right, so I came back and said, dear John, I want to do this. He replied with a subject, what is patient engagement? And it was a completely different. And when I attacked back on another one, he stopped, ex he stopped responding. And the, the other thing I want to leave you with, because every one of you, whether you've ever heard of participatory medicine or not, you need to understand that when it's your family's care, there is, n there is no guarantee that anybody's going to be on your side except you. And this goes back to one of the things that Hugo Campos found. The earliest mention I've seen of nothing about us without us was in the disability rights movement in the 1980s in South Africa, where as wheelchair regulations were getting written, they found that if they weren't involved, the regulations came out stupid. And, they, and a comment that came out, whoa, a comment that came out uh, following up on that was, when someone else speaks for you, you lose which is exactly what the feminists like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton found when they sent men to represent them in Congress. Thank you. Woo! Thank you very much for your passion and energy. And I really love the statement, nothing about me without me, but I think it's not enough. Uh, I think we need to go beyond that. As we think about designing the systems that will enable true participatory medicine, um, we need to look at the most difficult, difficult situations for this, and that's where I work. Um, for example, I work in adolescent health information access issues, and I can talk about this from personal experience as a patient as well as from being a pediatrician, um, but I'll share one brief example, or stat basically. So adolescents diagnosed with cancer, only 13% of them are informed about their fertility options. And it's because many times you have differences and agreements between parents and adolescents. And many times, I've seen this firsthand, the pediatric oncologist is actually more sympathetic with the parent than the child because they see themselves in the eyes of the parent. Where a 16-year-old girl with leukemia may want to preserve her eggs before starting chemo but her parents want her to start chemo first so that she'll live. This is an extremely, extremely difficult area of decision making. It's, I think, among some of the most challenging, and that's really kind of the area that I've decided to tackle head on. Um, what do patient portals look like that enable this conversation and that go across all the different state lines where in Texas, a teen does not have the right to hide any information from their parent. Um, states like Massachusetts have mature minor doctrine laws, whereas states like New York and California don't. It's a very complex minefield, and basically it's more of a comment but also a question to, to begin to think about this. How do we think beyond nothing about me without me, um, not just in adolescence, but also you know where you have multiple caretakers? Um, and so that as we... It's a word of caution as we design the next systems to really actually start with the most difficult cases first um, so that we don't design systems that don't address that. So thank you. That's uh, what I wanted to say. Thank you.
Um, mostly, I just wanted to say thank you so much for being so passionate and having so much energy and giving voice to this issue that many of us um, hold near and dear. But I couldn't help thinking there, there must be something. What drives you to have the passion for this? Is there one single thing that you've experienced or seen that gives you the energy to fight for this? <laughs> <laughs> every, every day you see things. I, the, I guess for me there's nothing that's more, there's nothing that's worse than abuse of power. I think, I think there's a privilege to be a healthcare provider and we need to be able to develop the system so that we can provide the kind of health and assistance and support and empowerment, engagement, all the things that we've talked about in ways that we are it's very difficult to do now. Not because we don't want to, but because the systems don't do that. And I don't know, I just aspire to a better future and I, I, I would like to see be part of that change. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. Yep. 15 seconds. 15. Amazing. Anish Chopra of Health 2.0 said half the hospitals in the country uh, affirmed under pain of perjury that not one patient had asked them for their full data. <laughs> so that's a big problem. Second, Anish and others are working with the area around the new standard of fire. and We've got to get this movement connected with the people working on fire straight away because if we've got a hope of getting stuff out that's not the five and a half thousand pages, I don't know what it was, it's going to have to come out electronically and these new standards are away. And a lot of the people working in that area are actually very passionate on the techie side, are pa passionate about it. And I haven't heard that said today. So that's the, I mean, I will help make that connection as much as I possibly can. But that's where we at SPM have got to go because we've got to figure out how to put the story behind that technology change. And that's really urgent now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay, you. I guess we are, are we, we moving right on? Or? I'm sorry. No, okay, but I didn't know if we were having.